So again, welcome everybody. I'm Arnton Alsterfjord and I'm the global head of the KCS Academy. And that's the training and certification arm of the Consortium for Service Innovation. And welcome to our KCS Aligned and Verified Vendor Series. And in this series, um, you get to hear KCS best practices from experts from our aligned and verified vendors and often their community in this case. And for those not familiar with our KCS Aligned and Verified program, it's an elite group of tools that support the KCS practices. And in the case of our verified vendors, they have demonstrated they support all eight KCS practices. Um, and our aligned vendors are more specialized. So they've proven that they support elements of the KCS methodology. And uh, this webinar is sponsored by Coveo and they're one of our KCS aligned vendors. And I'm pleased to introduce Patty Leno and Colin Strachan. And Patty is the Director of Support Services at Tyler Technologies. And Colin is the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Coveo. And as we all know, KCS is a journey, not a destination. Um, and it's one that Patty has led since before launching the KCS B6 program at Tyler Technologies in 2019. And in this webinar, Patty, joined by Colin, will share the best practices she's learned along the way to keep the program successful and expand knowledge across the organization. But some housekeeping before we begin. So this session is being recorded and will be posted on our site as well as sent out to all who have registered. And this is a public video, so feel free to share it. But please make sure that you're on mute and put your questions in chat. So we're gonna have representatives from Tyler Technologies and Coveo monitoring the chat and they'll either answer them in the chat, uh, bring them up to Patty as appropriate in the flow or save them for the Q&A session at the end. And we should have a good amount of time for Q&A. So this would be really nice. Um, and also wanna make sure that you're aware of upcoming KCS Academy events. So Jennifer Mortcat, our community success manager will be posting the link uh, in the chat to our events page for all the upcoming chats, uh, upcoming events. Um, and I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Patty and Colin. Nice, thank you so much, uh, and Thank you very much for having us today. Um, so I know that many of you will be familiar with Caveo already, um, but for those that aren't, I just wanted to give a, a quick introduction. Uh, so Caveo is an AI powered uh, relevance platform uh, that provides search recommendations and personalization at scale. Um, and we do that because um, you know, personalization drives business outcomes, right? And I think this is something that's becoming increasingly apparent. Um, I know that Patty is gonna talk a bit about the importance of personalization uh, across the organization at Tyler today. Um, you can see that we've been in this business for a while. Um, so going back to 2005, we were very much known as an enterprise search uh, company, uh, but since then our product has really evolved beyond search uh, to the point where we're now really all about giving the right experience to the right person at the right time, whether that be through search or through proactive uh, content delivery. Um, and of course, by doing that, we're able to meet customers and support agents where they are um, and really drive personalized experiences right across uh, that journey. Um, so with that, uh, Patty, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Colin. And thanks, Arndt and the team for inviting us here today to share some of our journey. I am a support director here at Tyler Technologies. My name is Patty Leno, and I am working here out of our Yarmouth main office where the weather is beautiful. Tyler Technologies is North America's largest company solely focused on providing software and services to the public sector. It's all we do. We have over 37,000 installations and in more than 12,000 locations. We're headquartered in Plano, Texas, not too far from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We also have offices across the United States, Canada, and the Philippines. There's 6,600 team members. About 1,000 of those are working in support. And we're diverse. Tyler has eight divisions across five solution groups. We have public administration, course and public safety, health and human services, K-12 education, including transportation and transformative technologies. Our vision is connected communities. What we're hoping to do is to connect our clients and contacts and data and processes across entities, including citizens and Caveo and KCS enable us to reach that vision. 
So when I talk about um, when we started our journey here at Tyler, our KCF goals were very simple and probably resonate with you. We wanted to reduce headcount by encouraging self-service success. We wanted to increase our first contact resolution, and we wanted to increase customer satisfaction by reducing the time to resolve. From a best practice perspective, one of the things that we learned on our journey is that we started wanting to search everything we owned. We looked across the organization and said, we've got to have it all. And what we really found out was, no, I just need to get what I need. So on that journey of searching everything to searching what we need to bring us to that point of sufficient to solve, we've been able to do that with the Caveo tool and with their staff to guide us. One of the questions that I most asked when we started the journey is, what tool should I use? What tool are you using? And I'll tell you today what everyone told me, which is, it isn't the tool, it's the process. It's about KCS. So you do want to know what we're using, and I'll share that. We are using some legacy content. We are creating knowledge articles in a homegrown confluence space, as well as Microsoft Knowledge. We have additional client content, so content that like white papers that may not be knowledge articles in a SharePoint space. And we're doing that all in dynamic CRM. That's where we log our support cases for our agents, as well as the dynamic CRM portals for our clients to log support cases. And all of that's done through this power of Caveo. One just a sec, I gotta move, I gotta move something that's in my way. Alrighty. So how did we get to that tool stack? We started our intention as Tyler a year ago, a decade ago, excuse me, was to purchase a knowledge management system. So it may be helpful to know that Tyler experiences organic growth and growth through acquisition. And when we have an acquisition, each acquisition brings its own set of knowledge. So we had to come to terms with the fact that all knowledge was not going to be in one source all the time. In our review of knowledge management tools, it became clear that an organization as robust and diverse as Tyler was going to need a machine learning, AI-driven enterprise search to bring everything together to support that connected community's vision. When we looked at knowledge management systems, most of them supported an insight into their own content, but only federated into external content. And I'm sure you know from your own experiences that relevance isn't determined by the source that the knowledge lives in. We wanted to make sure that all sources have the equal opportunity to be the most relevant or the most trusted content. And that's what led us to Caveo. And our Caveo proof of concept affirmed the KCS, it was V5 at the time, now V6, that this is exactly what we needed to do. So before we dove into our KCS journey, we needed to start with a knowledge inventory, which became our statement of work for Caveo. But in addition to implementing the tool, we needed to drive staff education. We needed to get out the message of search early, search often. We did that with presentations, we did that in meetings with casual conversations, and we did that with weekly email tips as well. And a best practice I'd share that we've learned is you need to focus on modeling that behavior, behavior that encourages good search habits. It's okay to ask somebody who asks you a question, did you search? In addition to preparing staff for our knowledge-centered service, which is a really big change, we needed to know where we were going. We needed to have that vision for how we were gonna achieve our connected communities. And while the steps to the vision, to that journey may vary by team or solution or division, we are united by that drive to personalization. And my recommendation for you is don't lose sight of that goal. It's easy for people to come up and say, hey, I need this source, I need this information but look at every source that you're bringing in, all the knowledge you're bringing in through the lens of personalization. Because personalization is serving that most relevant content, the right content to the right person at the right time. 
And the beauty here is that personalization serves both service and marketing. And that's an easy way to help funding. And Cadeo just wasn't a one-time purchase for us to do once. It's to continue on this journey to personalization. We need to continue that engagement with each source we bring in, with each decision we make toward that goal so we have optimization. Um, and maybe you can take a moment, Colin, and explain uh, to folks who maybe aren't in working in personalization how, what that journey looks like. Yeah, thanks, Patty. Well, I, I love what, how you focused on search early, search often as you were beginning the implementation, because you know it's really um, these interactions with the search interface that give you the data um, to move along this model um, that you're showing right now. Um, so the more you can get people using that uh, as early as possible, uh, the better. Um, and also the point you made about federated search not being sufficient for you is, is quite important. You know, that's actually something that sets Coveo apart um, because only with a unified index could you really establish uh, true relevance and provide the modern search experience that, that people are expecting. Um, you know, otherwise that content really remains segregated at the source, which limits um, how it can be, how it can be ranked. Um, so yeah, tell us, if, um, you know, from Tyler's perspective, how this journey kind of looked like for you. It's a great comment about the unified search because we have our habits and we tend to feel most confident with the knowledge we've written. Well, I wrote something and I put it here. So that's the only place I'm going to look for something. And the nice thing about having unified search is it says, hey, look over there. You missed that. So it's a great opportunity to make sure that we are surfacing information that maybe you didn't know existed. So we began our journey as Tyler working toward self-service success in June of 2016. We were able in our first uh, interface for staff in March of 2017 to launch an internal staff interface that is browser-based uh, that we continue to use today that we've continued to add more content to. We followed that in May 2017 with the external interface. So this is for our clients on tylertech.com, our website, and we began with a pilot group in our ERP division and moved on to other groups, adding additional sources as they became available. Important to note for some of you that we do require a login authentication to use our client resources on our website. Not everyone does. So that's something that's important to us is having that um, unified uh, security so that we know that we've got um, some information about the person who's looking and we're making sure that we're protecting other people's information as we're sharing knowledge. Enterprise ERP, which is the group that uh, I'm primarily working with, launched our KCS V6 program on 1031 2019 That's when we went live with it. Just before that, in June 2018, we had deployed the Agent Insight Panel in Dynamic CRM. So that's where our agents are working the cases and they have knowledge that surfaces right within the panel. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and then in August of 2019, we launched the what we're called the Answer Panel, which is the Caveo case deflection. So in the portals for clients, it's essentially the agent panel for clients in the portal. As they're logging a support case, they can engage with knowledge in the side panel. We then continued in the portal with launching recommendations. So this is an option when you first go into, when a client first goes into the Dynamics portals and sees three pieces of relevant content that relate to their most used product. And we're continuing to beef up, we'll talk further about personalization to inform those three recommendations to improve the content that's showing there. 2020 was more of a development year for us. Uh, there were a lot of big things that happened in 2020. Certainly, we all remember for us mid-March when we all went home. But for our enterprise ERP division, we launched our external articles. It became uh, an important initiative, but it became an imperative initiative because our clients were home too. So we needed to really boost that self-service experience by taking the knowledge articles that we started creating in October and bringing them out to clients in the summer of 2020. Our enterprise justice group also went live on Microsoft Knowledge. They were the first group in Tyler to use Microsoft Knowledge and we've continued on since then with other divisions as well. We did do some foundation work as I mentioned in 2020. So we were able in April of 2021 to launch what we call Tyler Search, our Caveo interface out into Dynamics portals for our customer. 
So now when a client goes to portals, they can manage their cases, they can log a new case and engage with the, the answer panel or the case deflection, but they also can search right there for knowledge, scope to the products that they're using. So for me, I felt that the way that we were gonna support the connected community's vision was to put all Tyler knowledge into the same Caveo org, which is a pretty big task, but that's what I felt we needed to support the connected communities. For the enterprise division, the connected communities has a lot to do with integration, meaning not just uh, a swapping or an API of information back and forth, but taking multiple Tyler products and having full integration as though they are a single product, moving information back and forth. So from a practical perspective, what does that actually mean for our agents? So if an agent is logging a support case, we start with the issue information. So this is the description of the issue that's available. And then we bring in the context for the product details. So this is an example of some product details right from that case as they're logging uh, the new issue. So agent A may be an expert in product A and their articles might be in Confluence. Agent B is an expert in product B and their articles might be in Microsoft Knowledge. But if our two products integrate, agent A right there within the case screen is able to see knowledge from both agent A and agent B. It doesn't matter who wrote it. It doesn't matter which knowledge article system it lies, lies in. All that matters is that right there in the case, based on the issue and the context of the product details, that we can serve information no matter where it comes from. And then our agents can continue to refine in the agent panel by putting in different search criteria, different search terms in the box, as you can see in that last screenshot, or by refining the search content, the tabs or the filters within that content. So in the example I've shown here, we have an article from a couple of years ago that was used as a first contact resolution for this particular case. That knowledge, I didn't have to go ask anybody. It's right there for the agent, real time, while they're working in the solve loop. And answers are found in one to two seconds. So it happens all day long, agents able to leverage the knowledge of the organization and bring it together in the resolution. And this is cool, but what if we could add personalization? What if you could know more about me? So on the tech side or the tool side, we're talking about everything building off personalization as our lens. So we've seen already interjecting a helper API with personalization logarithms to come into our agent panel and improve the content. So when I say improve, it's fewer results and more relevant content in those first three to five positions. But from the customer perspective, we've got the knowledge articles that are coming in, which is basically the client wants to see what are other people asking. And from a, pers from a security perspective, from a PII perspective, you can't show one client another client support cases, but you can definitely bring in the information in the knowledge article, that question and answer that the other client asked is now a question and answer that the second client can take a look at. By understanding more about who you are, what is your job description? What products do you work with? What do you do at that site? Taking that information, knowing who I am and what I need and how I'm like another client will help us to bring that knowledge not only to the agent, but moving forward into um, our learning management system, which we'll be indexing this year, and then Case Assist, which is that uh, Caveo solution, which is a guided case submission with knowledge through the process. So the personalization in this case takes up the basic product details and moves it up into knowing more about the person who's looking for knowledge and how they're going to find that information. So we're just beginning our journey. We're working heavily on personalization, working toward the Case Assist, and Colin, maybe you could share some additional details about uh, Case Assist and implementing it. 
Yeah, exactly. So case assist is a really exciting feature for us that we we, we launched uh, within the last year. And you can see an example here on the left. Um, so there are really two elements to it. Uh, one is the case classification machine learning model, which automatically classifies the case as the user's typing details into the form. Um, and it's really a classic case of machine learning because it's, uh, it's it learns from correctly classified cases in order to improve, improve its ability uh, to classify uh, moving forward. Um, and then what it's also doing, of course, is recommending relevant content in real time to try and solve the case. Uh, so it's built for case deflection, but in the in the event that the ticket gets submitted, it's designed to you know firstly reduce the instance of you know a ticket ending up in the wrong queue or being assigned to the wrong person, um, but also to give uh, agents uh, the relevant knowledge they need to to tackle the case. Awesome. And you may be saying, well, that's great, but how are you going to do that? How are you going to get that personalization? So there are really two ways that we're going to bring that in, uh, the, both on, from the client side and the back end. So from the client side, this is just a, a preview look at a new change that we're making in our portals. We're currently testing it, where the customer, when they come to our Dynamics portals, when they come to the website to manage their cases, look for knowledge, or submit a case, they also have a profile. And when this is deployed, they'll be able to come in here, update some personal information and update their job information. So what department or agency or office do they work in? What's their title? So that we can start to get some commonality so that Caveo can capture when somebody who's a finance director searches this content, maybe we want to boost that based on that usage. What's their functional area? And you'll notice that job functional area job function and function type are drop downs, which it makes it even easier than free text fields. Job description or a title can be a little bit difficult, but having the job function in there is really going to help us. So for tens of thousands of clients who engage with us every year, trying to gather that information organically is difficult. So when we deploy this, we'll be able to engage the client and help us to gather more information so we know them. We're also doing it on the back end. So that helper API that I referenced earlier is actually going through and saying, well, what kind of cases does this person log? What kind of cases does the, uh, do other people from that account log? What products does that account own? What Tyler community subscriptions does that user belong to? There's so much information, marketing uh, subscriptions. So the more information we can pull in, as people are using the system and it's learning, the more we can tailor that content toward the question they're asking and the job function of the person. As part of this process, we're also going to be uh, taking advantage of smart snippets, which is a fairly new feature in Caveo. It gives us the opportunity to take content that lends itself to a very simple question and answer process. So as we engage with the case assist, We'll want to make sure that the knowledge that's coming in is similar to a content standard, is presented in a very reasonable, uh, readable, and easily accessible form and comfortable form to work with. So that's something that we'll be working on as we're getting ready to do the case assist. So I've talked a lot about tools and about technology, which is a big part of what we're discussing here today. But I, no discussion of KCS would be complete without explaining and celebrating the value of coaching in the KCS program. It's easy to start and say, well, I'll get a knowledge base and I'll ask people to write articles and we'll applaud when we write them. But if we don't coach, your program is going to atrophy. That's definitely our experience. And my recommendation is if you're, if you're going to dive into KCS, dive into coaching. If you don't, you'll find that your candidates will get discouraged. So your new people that you're trying to bring into the program won't have that peer support. They won't necessarily have that management support and they won't understand what to do and they won't uh, be robust and successful as they move through the program. You'll also find that bad habits will be formed. The content standard is comfortable and makes knowledge articles wonderful but it's new, it's a change, and it's a change in process. So without that coaching strength, you'll find that people will make their own decisions, and then you'll need to go back and unlearn some of those habits. 
And also, it's important to understand that managers will give up on the promises of KCS. They're expecting something wonderful. And I absolutely can say something wonderful happens when you adopt KCS and practice KCS. But if we don't coach and we don't bring the program along, then managers will say, well, why am I devoting time to this? Why are people doing this extra work? And you can't survive without manager buy-in. The consortiums really helped us to understand that our traditional management practices for performance evaluation are at odds with KCS practices. The, the old do not put goals on activities is so real, but our management teams love to have metrics and love to have metrics that really are more activity driven than the end result of the work that we're doing. So, so what can you do? It, it is a, it's a tough spot to be in sometimes, but Caveo helps us out. They, Caveo has robust analytics and we could talk for days about the different reporting. What I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about reports that might help you in your coaching endeavor. And so when we're coaching, we're looking to make sure that people are searching, that they're finding results, and then they're sharing those results through that process. So the report that I'd like to show you today is, this is a standard agent side panel participation report in your Conveo Analytics reporting. And the report sample here, I just want to talk to you a little bit about how you can use this as part of the coaching tool. This is not a report that you run and then distribute. This is not a report that you run and immediately say, oh, that number, this is what that means. This is a report that gives you an idea of how the agent is interfacing with the side panel and how they're being successful. So the first thing I'll say is without knowing the name of the person on the left or the job description, you can't just take this report and draw a conclusion. What you need to do is understand the work that they do, understand the goals of how KCS supports their work, and then understand the information here. So the column headings, just to introduce you, the first is the search event count. Every time you open a case screen, the agent panel loads, and that is a first search. So every time you open a case, you're going to get a single search event. The manual search event is what I showed you in the earlier slide, where someone goes into the panel and adds additional search terms. So they're in interfacing with the search panel to try to refine the results. The refined search is using the tabs and facets to further refine the content. So the manual search and the refine are the two engagement measures with the side panel. Click event is, I click on it to look at it, whether it's a, a preview or I'm launching it. And then the attach to case, because ultimately that's our goal is that we find knowledge and we attach it to the case so that we can resolve that case, either first contact or provide information to move that case along. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some different scenarios here. Let's look at this first one, agent one. So an active agent, we've got over 9,000 um, opportunities where we've engaged with the agent panel and the case screen. And we've got a pretty high level of searching and refining our searches, which, which suggests we're engaging. The items I've circled are the click event count and the attached to case. So in that work, they have clicked on over 2,000 items and linked 68. Again, you cannot draw just a straight conclusion, but looking at this, it's easy to start a conversation that asks whether people are finding what they need. If they're clicking that much and not attaching to case, the, the suggestion might be they're not finding what they need, or they may not be creating the draft articles or the WIP articles with the questions. One of the things that's hardest for us in this change to KCS is to adopt the practice of creating an article when we have the question, a known question, versus waiting until we resolve the question to create the article. So that's one possible for agent one. Agent two, also very active looking at cases, is really not engaging at all with the agent panel. So it's almost as though it doesn't even need to be on the screen. There are a couple of reasons we might be looking at this. This might be an analyst or lead or manager who's looking at the case but not engaging with the knowledge and helping, our, um, helping the agent who's assigned to the case 
to continue to work with it, or this might be somebody, if this is a tier one or tier two, who isn't even engaging with the panel at all. You won't know until you know who you're talking about, but this is an indication of no engagement, and that's a good conversation starter, is how do you look for knowledge when you're working to resolve cases? Agent three, also very active in terms of the number of times they're, they're going into cases. Uh, pretty healthy engagement, but one of the things we notice here, and I've circled, is the refined. So if you remember, the refined is looking at the tabs and looking at the filters over on the right. They've got a pretty high click count and, and a, a not as high uh, attached to case count. So what that's telling me is that they are likely going to their favorite source. So they're, they're starting, it starts on the all tab and they're going to their favorite source and then they're clicking around trying to find something and not that successful and then linking. So I think the conversation here is looking at opportunities to um, improve either how that case and issue is being logged so that we're getting the results. It also might indicate on an administrative perspective some pipeline tuning. So this isn't all about the agent here. There's also some tuning in the org to make sure that the machine learning is as successful as it possibly can be. And then the fourth example is someone who's got a healthy amount of activity and a really reasonable blend of interacting with the panel and attaching to case. And I think there are likely two possibilities here. One, this might be a brand new candidate and they're just getting started. And this is what new candidate activity with the panel might look like. Or they might be a more senior person who's only linking the stuff they know. And so they're coming in, they're doing the same thing, they're linking those articles. Those, those cases that are repetitive that we have multiples are, again, not knowing who the person is, you can't jump to that conclusion. But those are two possibilities for looking at this information. My point in showing this really is this report is amazing. There's a lot of detail for agent engagement with the panel, but don't jump to conclusions. Don't just print the report and distribute it. Look at it, ask yourself the questions, understanding what each column means. And then in that coaching conversation, have that person show you how they engage with the panel, how they look for information. Take a, take a live case, work through it. And this will, um, this will really help guide that coaching conversation. Might be important for you to know, looking at this, I've, I've saved the metrics to the end, that our average click rank is 2.4. So that means that when we, are, um, when we are clicking, we are taking in the top three, the, the items that we're looking for is in the top three. I would also tell you that our current attached to case is about 25 to 27%. So what that means, and again, metrics are numbers that, that people like to see numbers, but thinking about it from a logical perspective, that means that 75% of our cases are potentially missed opportunities. Now, it's not gonna be that whole uh, pool of missed opportunity, but understanding where people are clicking and understanding what our link rate is will help us to better in our coaching conversation understand where those missed opportunities might be. So what does healthy engagement look like? I mentioned coaching is not about reviewing reports or providing reports. It's really an interactive process. And what a coach can do is first and foremost, praise good work, when we've got uh, great articles being created, when we have people who are flagging and fixing, when we are attaching to case, we wanna make sure that we celebrate that. In our organization, we have an opportunity for, to nominate people for awards and people do nominate for KCS articles and for work on KCS and for being a leader or modeling good behavior. So it's important to make sure that we are celebrating those successes. Um, we definitely are focusing on article creation, making sure we have good articles that are, are created properly with uh, the content standard, but also really looking at the WIPs. 
are people creating the article when they've already known the answer, when they're at the end of the solve loop, or are they creating that article while they're working that case, putting that question in so that we can do more collaboration? So that's a really important job of the coach is, is looking at uh, what's happening with the WIPs. Are they being created? Are they being used? We certainly are looking at linking. We need to know, are we linking? Are we finding? Um, and we do look at the percent of our own cases linked. But again, we're not looking at link rate and ranking people and, and celebrating that metric or statistic. We're celebrating the success of moving cases along, certainly working for, toward that first contact resolution, and ultimately these articles working toward client self-service success. And then finally, the reuse. One of my favorite reports, uh, or I guess cards in the analytics and Caveo is the top articles link. And what we did uh, share a best practice for us was to add the author to that card so that we, when we look at the top articles link, we can look at the author and we can celebrate that success. There's bragging rights for having uh, an article that is, is used and used successfully and reused. So don't forget to celebrate the work that people do in that reuse. As I said, the, the uh, Caveo analytics are robust. There's a lot there. And there were a couple of tips that I'll share with you that our CSM help with. This is not custom work. And this is, can be easily done by anyone in your CSM can help you. The first one is cascading filters. So creating that first page in your analytics where you can actually select, in this example, I've shown the business unit and the team. So the business unit might be enterprise ERP and the team might be purchasing. And so being able to actually scope the rest of the tabs in the analytics to the selections you've made here, that's one of the things that helps us to have a single org for all of Tyler so that people can get out their individual teams and groups. And then the second is to put in cards as an in-report legend. Um, as many times as I've talked about the manual and refined search, I always have to remind myself what the difference is between the manual and refined search. And if you take a moment and create a card in your report that provide a legend, either a description of the column headings for your users or tips like you see here on how you can utilize the report, that keeps the person trying to use the reporting from being overwhelmed and having to go someplace else to get that information. So there's a little bit about analytics or, and a little bit about metrics, but what I really wanna focus on now is the reporting that our coaches are doing. I said that the coach's job isn't to generate paperwork, but the fact is you do need reporting for accountability and for your KCS program managers to gauge the health of the program and the health of the database. So our original coaching report was more of an article quality index. And in all honesty, people still use that as a worksheet. But the problem with an AQI style report is that it doesn't really allow you to discuss what's happening. So it's a column report with specific categories and our coaches are spending more time trying to fit their results into those categories rather than to just look at what's happening. So our KCS program manager, Mariah, who's um, also working in the chat here today, and you'll have a chance to meet her in a moment. She basically blew up our coaching report, and this is our version two. And it's very simple, and it's very flexible. It tracks what's important. So in that coaching meeting, what were the highs? What were the successes? What did you celebrate with that candidate or that contributor that you're coaching? Were there any challenges? What are, they, what are they struggling with? Were they on late shift last week and they were having trouble with uh, channel support? Whatever that happens to be, there's an opportunity to note it here. And then the follow-up items. What do you want to talk about in next week's coaching session? What are items you might want to follow up with a manager about? And finally, how was the coaching session conducted? Was it live? Was it uh, video or in person? Uh, were cameras on? That's important information to understand how that communication is taking place between the coach and the candidate. And again, it provides some valuable information for the program manager. These reports are required of our coaches now. That was not so in the beginning. 
and they're required to be posted at the secure location so that um, the program manager has access, but also our managers have access. So this is an opportunity to engage the managers. It's easy to understand. They don't have to have been through KCS training in order to understand the information here. If they're not seeing reports, it allows them to start the conversation with their coach, say, hey, what's going on on my team? If they are here, it allows the manager the opportunity, again, in team meetings to celebrate those successes and in one-on-one -on -one conversations to help guide towards successful KCS um, participation. As we talked earlier, I know most of you, I'm assuming most of you have struggled as we have with managers wanting metrics, wanting reports that have numbers on them. Um, with equating a link rate to performance or efficiency. And that's really not the case. And we are definitely just beginning our uh, reporting journey. We have a lot of work to do in terms of pulling everything together the way that we want to get the information to create a total picture of the success of our agents. But we need to make sure that when we're looking at items, we're looking at article reuse, which you're not necessarily just going to get on a metrics report. Um, when we look at the Caveo analytics and we see that our search queries have moved past the one word query, which I think is a major success point when you're working with helping people to learn to search to be consumers of knowledge when they get past that one word search uh, point. And another best practice I'll share is something that our program manager is starting next month, which is refresher training. Um, we have a habit of thinking one and done, right? I close that case, I move on to the next. The same thing when we look at KCS, just because I've been through candidate training, just because I've been promoted to a contributor or maybe even a publisher, doesn't mean I don't need an infusion, doesn't mean I don't need a refresher. So don't hesitate to consider putting refresher training into your process. I'd like to finish with a little more information about what we've learned about coaching. It's important to have peer coaches. If the coach is someone who controls the compensation of the candidate or contributor, it's not going to be a successful relationship because they're going to be working, the, the co piece, person being coached is going to be working toward how do I please you? How do I make you happy for my compensation? So it's important to choose peer coaches. You're going to have people grow in the organization to be promoted. You're gonna need others to come in, uh, but we definitely recommend sticking with the peer coach. It's also important to have individuals who are excited about the program and driven to success. Not everybody can be a coach. Not everyone should be. Not everyone wants to be. Choose your people who want to be. Just because they were a member of your KCS council doesn't mean that they're going to be in your first coaching group or a later coaching group. Look for people who are interested in this, interested in that mentoring and peer coaching environment. You also need to consider personality. Not all of us are meant to coach, and that's fine. Some people choose to bring their careers more toward people management, some more toward the technical you want to have coaches who are individuals that are comfortable working with peers and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. I think probably a good point to say that um, in the beginning, we did some group coaching. That wasn't a really successful opportunity for us to sustain. And we have found that individual coaching is definitely more successful for us. So I'd share that as a, as a lesson learned or a best practice tip. And then finally, part of coaching is that accountability. So we do expect those weekly coach reports. Uh, to be posted for our program manager and our managers to review. And it, you get past that, um, that verbal or that head shake, yeah, I'm doing it, everything's going okay. We need that confirmation that everything's going okay. One question you may have since we did uh, start our program on the enterprise ERP side at the end of 2019 is how COVID impacted uh, our coaching. And I would say that COVID itself, the, the work from home, we were primarily an in-office population. I, I wouldn't say that that impacted our coaching. What I would share is that it really exposed some of the weaknesses in our coaching. As we all moved to remote um, and people weren't used to having cameras on, it, it showcased whether or not we were having weekly meetings whether or not we were engaging 101, 
whether or not we were just chatting to someone and, and the other person saying, yep, got it covered, uh, to really have that engagement. So I wouldn't say the, the work from home really um, disrupted the coaching, more so that it exposed some areas that we could improve on. And, and that's really where we've done the reboot is to, um, is as we've grown to uh, be able to manage the coaching and support our coaches the way that they need to be supported to be successful. So in summary, I talked today about personalization and coaching. From a personalization standpoint, I would recommend that you keep this goal in sight. It is, we feel, the key to relevance. It's the way, you know, for us with acquisitions to bring all the information into one place and to make sure that if I'm looking for a warrant, that I have enabled the system and our resources to be able to know, is it a payable? Is it a purchasing warrant? Is it an excise? Is it a public safety warrant? Is it in our enterprise software? Is it in our pro software? Is it in a, a legacy piece of code? We need all that information. So we need that personalization and that's going to bring us to self-service success. If a client could come and use our resources and we know who they are and we give them what they need, that will encourage them to come back. So I would encourage you to adopt personalization and to view everything that you do in your program toward the lens of personalization to make sure it fits in. And from a coaching perspective, some of our big takeaways is we absolutely believe it is vital to a successful KCS practice, not only getting started, but also engaging in. To keep it simple, don't overburden your coaches with reporting. Give them something they can work with and support them in that process of working with it. That will also help with that management support. It's important to model strong search behavior and engagement with the content standard. If you aren't doing it, and people aren't seeing you do it, then why would anyone else join in with the fun? Keeping in mind the sufficient to solve, again, don't overcomplicate. Bring the pieces that you've got in. Don't index every piece of content you own across your entire organization, but think about what's going to be useful and helpful. Accept the fact that the level of effort you put in is going to give the level of success out. And coaching, I think, is the hardest thing in KCS and easy to give up. So don't. Go for it. Get involved. Get engaged. Excite your coaches. Support them. And you'll have a successful KCS practice. And with that, do we have some questions? And I think most of them have been answered. <clears throat> I know there was a uh, good job early on awesome. uh, question on case deflection. If, uh, as you are able to search both the technical documentation, as well as the articles, if you are seeing more of the, uh, articles being used versus technical documentation, Mariah said, you know, it really depends on what they're looking for, but, uh, any overall, um, are most of your links from, your knowledge articles or is a, a representation also from documentation? That's a great question. That's excellent. Yeah. Yes. They, they definitely are more from, uh, from the knowledge articles and the more knowledge articles we have, we have almost 10,000 client facing knowledge articles in our enterprise ERP group. So we are definitely seeing more engagement, our, our older KB, which could be some, you could call them articles, but more white papers in there. I think case deflection is one of those challenging topics because even before we purchased Caveo and started on our KCS journey, the first question I received from senior leadership is, what's our case deflection? Well, you know, what are you predicting? And then you know, a week later, what's the number? And I recently did a presentation for our Tyler Support Council where I provided four different opportunities where we're never going to have a metric for the case deflection. So we might not know, but one anecdotal I'll share with you is we have a support community and a client asked a question on the support community and another client took the article, print screened it, pasted it in the community post. So we know that articles are being used to self-serve. Uh, we know they're being shared. We know that other clients are helping each other with them but that doesn't actually touch a metric because it's happening in the support community. It's not help happening when they're logging a support case. So it's hard to capture that information, but we know it's happening and the articles are driving it. 
That's great. And did you also just an extension off that, it, like Mariah was um, hinting, alluding to that you guys create bridge articles also. So for example, if there is information in the documentation, but let's say it's very large and maybe not in the customer context, are you creating knowledge articles that would have that customer context more specific about their issue and then a link to the um, the documentation, a deep link in there? Do you do that also or, or maybe how do you bridge those? Absolutely. So the idea is not to duplicate content. As you're coaching people, you're looking to see if they're searching and using what's out there as opposed to creating a duplicate article. That's one of the things even back to the old AQI that you look for is, is this a duplicate article? You're just trying to hit a metric of creating articles. So one of our strategies to avoid doing that is to make sure uh, that we're able to link back to source documentation so that if something changes, we don't have to change it in multiple places. It gets changed back in that piece. So that's one of the great benefits of the knowledge article is you can include that link. Not only the link to uh, something else if it provides the resolution, but maybe you have the resolution in the article and then a link to content for more information. So we can use the links in a couple of different ways. Great, thank you. And uh, they were asking what, what's the time commitment for coaching? Um, and Mariah, if you wanna give some input on that. No, it's much easier to, to say than type out actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have, uh, we have uh, candidates who are our first level for KCS licensing. So when people are first starting out, what I ask for is uh, 15 minutes of face-to-face -face time. So you can go through the reporting at other times um, or you can review cases at other times, but to get that 15 minutes of face-to-face -face time per week um, to just go over you know, what you've been working on. And um, some people will need more than that. And some people, you know, that's fine. But just, I had to set a minimum to make sure that that face-to-face face -face time was actually happening. Um, because if it's, you know, if it's an email um, or uh, people don't set up the meeting invites, then it just gets missed entirely in a week. So that's our first level um, for candidates. So candidates are able to create articles, um, but they usually need a lot of handholding in the style and structure of an article. So until they get the hang of it, it's a weekly meeting. Um, and it can be more or less than that, or it can be more than that, I should say. <laughs> based on who you're, you know, who you're working with. Um, when, uh, when our participants make it to the, um, to the third level, which is a contributor, so they're able to uh, create articles and edit articles, and they should have at that point the style and the structure of an article down, um, then uh, we move to 15, at least 15 minutes a month. And that's assuming that the person's participation is in line with the expectation, you know, for their role, and, um, and that they're not dropping off. Again, it can be more than that. It cannot be less than that. Um, and then when we move into publishing, um, again, that's that same fifteen minutes holds true as well for uh, for publishers. Great. And I imagine there's also in addition to that face to face engagement or the engagement with a knowledge worker. There's the assessment that the coach is doing, as well as there's the the yeah. ratio of how many. So approximately how much time, uh, what percentage of their time since they're doing coaching part-time do they spend on coaching? Do you have? I, I would say, I would, I would say it's uh, probably, probably two hour, two or three hours a week. Um, okay. Would be uh, around, around what I would expect for, you know, someone who's coaching more than one person. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would say probably two or three hours a week. Is, okay. is what people Thanks, to, be, to be successful. <laughs> it might be a good point also to share that um, when, as Mariah is bringing on new candidates, she's looking at the depth of coaching that, that each team has, what they have for resources, what the burden is. She makes sure that, um, that each coach has a certain number and, and not overburdened uh, because we don't have people who are full-time coaches. So they're, they're doing that as part of the engagement, which really gives that uh, great peer 
experience both within the team and the knowledge. But it's as you're trying to hit your deadlines, if, you, if you've set deadlines for your KCS program and you get to that point of a bottleneck of coaches, if you don't have enough coaches to continue, then you have to back off on bringing in new candidates and begin to have discussions with the managers and the coaches on how you're going to develop the coaches on that team so that you can take in that new influx of new candidates. So it's, a, it's quite a balancing uh, game that she does pulling people back and forth to make sure that we're looking at each team to make sure that there's enough time uh, to manage and still do the regular work. Um, I just want to jump in and look at, uh, first off, Helen, uh, not only do we set minimum times, I do ask that, that they actually have calendar invites. That is so important because again, it, it's very easy to say that you'll get to it and, and then it gets completely missed. So that's also part of the minimum times. Uh, Samuel, as far as uh, personalization, I think, I think the thing that I really focus on is that different people, uh, that our participants are in different roles. So we have everyone from someone who started last week to someone who um, is a team lead and has been here for years. Um, and there's a lot of personalization that goes into that. Um, you know, we've set the minimum standards and we expect people to abide by them. Um, you know, some people need more attention than others. <laughs> um, but I would say that um, really, uh, really it comes down to uh, trying to get people not to focus on the numbers so much, but in your, in your role, what, uh, you know, where are the knowledge gaps that you should be seeing in your role? Um, and, and so there has been, uh, there, there's been some, uh, some, some discussions around, we want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So our tier one support are going to have, you know, different reporting results than, you know, our team leads. And so to really make sure that we're comparing team leads to team leads, and we're comparing um, analysts to analysts, um, and, you know, and our people who are just starting out to other people who are just starting out. Um, and, I, and I think that that makes a difference in how people consider the numbers um, and kind of back away from them a little bit. I also really, uh, Patty mentioned a, a presentation I did yesterday, uh, really trying to get people to focus on uh, making sure that we're making the most of our first contact uh, with a client and gathering up the information uh, that we should be that we should be getting in a first contact, and then also uh, focusing our efforts on uh, collaborating across teams and with other people, uh, and really rewarding that behavior. Because linking and creating and, and finding knowledge gaps follow if you're rewarding the behavior that lead to those things automatically happening. Um, so, uh, so there's that. Uh, and then Robert's uh, obstacles finding, I haven't had any trouble finding people to coach. Um, I think maybe one, one team uh, for a little while, but they were really stretched thin. Um, but I haven't had trouble to, uh, I haven't had trouble getting people to volunteer to coach once they were in a position, once they were at a licensing level that would allow them to coach. Um, we do have, we, we do have a decent amount of volunteers for that. And that's actually a little bit surprising to me, honestly. Um, and if a man uh, managers that don't allow time needed to coach, uh, really, I think that's where the coaching reports come come in. Uh, you know, again, Patty brought up the coaching reports. They're not incredibly detailed. There's, it, but it is. You know, what are the challenges? What are your high points? What are your low points? And you know, what do we need to work on? that's a good way to find out, are you meeting at all? Uh, you know, and if you're not meeting at all, why aren't you meeting at all? Is it because you don't have time? And that would be a discussion that either I or Patty would have with the manager to make sure that, that time is allotted. Or, uh, you know, we have some people that just take a little bit longer to competency. And that coaching report allows us to just recognize, you know, hey, this is what we're still working on. And that's okay too. Uh, so I, I think that uh, the coaching reports being um, as, as flexible as they are uh, really made sense for us because it allows people to, 
uh, really focus on the areas that really need to be focused on and gives me some insight into, uh, you know, if the coaching meetings are happening and what's, uh, you know, and what's holding anyone back or what they're doing well. And I think that's really important to recognize as well. Great. Well, thank you, Mariah. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Patty. We're just a minute over at the top of the hour, but awesome presentation and tremendous amount of uh, very useful information. So thank you so much and everyone have a great rest of their day.